Bernard, thank you so much for coming in and talking to me this morning. Uh, I just mentioned that I met Brian at a Durif workshop a short while ago, and uh, I've certainly met Barney a couple of times when I came out to the winery. So c can you tell me, how was it that the Gehrigs came to Barnawatha? Yes, thank you. Uh, Nick, um, plenty of Germans came out to Albury in the 1850s, amongst them several members of the Gehrig clan, different cousins, they might have been 12 to 15 of them, and settled in Albury, and some of them grew grapes in Albury. And my great-grandfather was, was one of those, came out to, uh, to his uncle in Albury, and he gravitated from there to Barnawatha as an employee at our place and consequently uh, when it was up for sale in 1867 he bought it. And, uh, and I presume he, he came from Germany uh, and uh, I presume he was in the industry in Germany but I'm not sure. Do you know if there, were, if there was vineyard on the property when he bought it? Yes, there was. It was begun in 1858. There's already vines on it, begun by the Barnawatha Vineyard Association, and when they dissolved the partnerships and sold up, he was already managing the place and took it over straight away. From reading my history way back, I have found out there was really a large, there was a large wine industry in the Albury area, and yet, while Rutherglen overcame phylloxera and was thriving again, it never really took off again in Albury. Did, did, you, did your family ever talk about that? The historical nature of it is Albury was New South Wales, which was in those days was a different country. There was border, border uh, charges put on uh, at the customs house and the there was big vineyards in Albury and a lot of vineyards around Barnawatha and Barnawatha North. Uh, but the Albury wines principally was probably sold into Victoria. And that, that market virtually collapsed when the charges were put over to go from one country to the other, from New South Wales to Victoria. And the railway came through in the early days in the 1860s and uh, probably made entry into Victoria and Melbourne markets con more considerable. But there was, our, our district in those early days, Barnawatha district was c covered in vines. Every farm had vines, without exception, I believe. But then over a long period of time, they dwindled off in numbers and the only ones left remaining were principally the ones around Rutherglen. And there were several bigger ones around Rutherglen, Graham's at Netherby, etc., And as well as Morris's at, uh, at Brown's Plains. And probably if you put Morris's, Brown's, Plains wines in, in acreages in with the ones in Barnawatha, North Barnawatha and the Indigo Valley, that would have been a bigger area of grapevines than Rutherglen actually. Mm. And do you know much about the wines they were making in the early years? No, no we don't. Uh, but uh, in the 1880s uh, distillation became common as they wanted to do something with wines that couldn't be sold or hard to sell with the, with the tyranny of distance to Melbourne and to overseas. So fortification came into being and the various stills in the district were, were put in and uh, there always was a still at our place but some of the wines in those early days were very ordinary and a lot of the farmers around our area were only small ones and principally they sold their wines on to Morris's anyway apparently. Mm -hmm. I do remember old Mr Charlie Morris telling us at home that his father or grandfather used to come make a tour each year right through the Barnawatha Middle Indigo area, Indigo Valley area, and he used to buy the wines on the dip and the lick. The dip in the cast to see how many gallons and a lick to see what the quality was. <laughs> but the wine trading like that was going on then, uh, mm. then, then just as well as it probably does now. Right, and then of, <clears throat> of course around the turn of the century, yeah, phylloxera came through and that made a big mess of the place. Phylloxera, yes, they wiped out the place and from that's what, 1878, I think the first mm. wine vines at uh, Geelong Way. Mm. By the turn of the century it had decimated our area anyway, and including Rutherglen, and some started up and others didn't. And plus, by that stage, your second, your second generation of 
winemakers, etc., in, in the area, and some families moved on, others didn't, and I suppose there would have been a hell of a mess then, and the First World War came in then as well, so there would have, it would, may not have been that profitable in those early days. And mm. some, of us, some of us persevered, but a lot of the small wineries went by the wayside even then. Mm. Well, it was, it was a shame seeing gaffers having hung on for so long, eventually, well, pulling the plug, what, what was that, early 80s or something like that, I think. The early, yeah. early 80s, that's true, yes. He, he made some distinctive type wines, which... Uh, well, 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 well sought after by a, a certain amount in the market. Well, weren't today's wines certainly, but they were, for what they were, they were wonderful and great. Mm. What's your first memory as a as a, a boy? Yeah, I suppose your first memories were just a few army trucks were at the end of war, and I went to a very small rural school with only 11, 12 kids pupils so mm -hmm. I was very isolated and so wasn't used to people and other other children um, but the first memory first memories are just your very local farm really rather than any neighbors mm. okay and of of the wine um, well those it? early days uh, we we didn't make much wine and the wine was a very ordinary quality I, I, as I now know uh, but we always had a small trade around the hotels in Aldrin Wodonga and uh, that, that kept father busy and it was only a small place and he, it was continually under pressure for, for quality and volume so uh, it was always a hard slong of wine anyway and my early memories always are working vines rather than the wine. Mm. And it's only in later years and we, when table wines in the middle 60s became more popular that you then had to transfer your expertise, etc., into quality and dry table wines rather than fortified. Mm. And um, when did a, a cellar door trade as we know it now first start? About, about 1965, 66. Uh, that's when it first kicked off and then it was doing so well that we thought we'd have a wine festival which was in 1967 and so that, that's, that's in that middle 60s is when it took off and people started to visit wineries etc for long weekends. You had, didn't have Sunday trading so your Saturday was a big day and the Sunday they visited other historic monuments etc. Were you selling most of your wine directly in bottle or did some of it go out in, in bulk to Melbourne or other wineries? It's a mixture of everything. We did sell some in bulk to other wineries. In those early days we sold a bit more, well, for, well that trade has gone now, we sold a lot in bulk to private people that would bottle 25 litres and 50 litres themselves. That trade has mm -hmm. disappeared. Uh, it disappeared at our place anyway, and I, I just don't know of it, it persevering today anyway. I haven't heard of it, so I, I think the bag in box put a well, it's, put it's an end a long to that. way. It's a long way before bag in the box, but it's what people did <coughs> in those early days to, to get something that was about three shillings a bottle. Mm. And who were some of the characters in the industry that you remember then? The characters are, are, are well known, my, as I quickly learnt that my father was a character in his own right. Uh, he had a basic education and isolated so he didn't have a lot of real learning in wine and wine quality but, but he, he, knew what he, he knew what he liked and he sometimes had strong opinions which not everybody else agreed with. But the, each, each, winery's, each winery's owner or manager or winemaker was their own little characters, whether it was Morris's uh, an old chassis and uh, Doug Jones and Seppels and Rutherglen and Mr Campbell and uh, Campbell's, Mr Buller and Buller's and um, Bill Chambers, he was only a young lad then. Uh, I never knew old Mr Chambers. Mm -hmm. I had the honour of meeting old Mr Smith the, in the early days, I only ever met him once, but, and then George became the character. Uh, so nearly every seller had an upfront man that was classified as a character in inverted commas. <laughs> what were your first jobs 
at Gerrigs. I mean, you said you recalled working in vineyards as, as much as anything. Well, your farms are different. Winery farms are different than today, where uh, you, you milked the cow, fed some chooks, and maybe we had a heap of pigs. Uh, we did all those jobs before you started on the jobs of the day with wine. Now, if you had employees coming, and we didn't always have employees, but different times of the year we did, well, they came at 8 o'clock, and your work day was 8 till 5. And these other jobs, boys' jobs, were before and after. So, but all of those boys' jobs uh, are gone now. Uh, and so you, the, the main jobs really are just your grapes and your, and your wine and your wine businesses, and you might even be away from home a lot, where one time the uh, people would be very rarely, if ever, away. Mm -hmm. And did you learn on the job, uh, or did you do wine studies elsewhere? <laughs> We or both? <laughs> no, we learned on the job. I didn't know anything about wine studies. I, uh, the, my first wine studies was a short course in wine quality control in 1976 at, at Wagga. Mm -hmm. And I was looking forward to that and appreciated that to no end. You must have been one of the first people through Wagga then. The very, very first short course that was put on at Wagga, I put my money in by the end of the second day of seeing it, the ad in the paper. Well it done. was about December the 6th or 8th in 1976. Mm -hmm. And uh, I and two or three other people, Max Cofield and someone from Seppels, I and Campbell's girl, went to it. Oh, how about that? I can remember that. It <laughs> It was very significant, I think, in, in so many aspects of wine education in this neck of the woods. Mm. Looking a bit further from Barnawatha now, have you, how have you seen Rutherglen, the district and the town, change over the years? It's changed, has it? Uh, <laughs> in, in your perspective? Well, my perspective of it is it hasn't changed much at all. And that's the pity, I think. Uh, I just really mean the bypass of the road situation. And that's, it, to me, it's a pity. I think if we could have been changed years ago, it'd be far more vibrant and a little bit more colour than it is today. Uh, and I think we've badly missed the boat there. The winemakers of Rutherglen was, was begun to to popularise the wines and to unify the industry and to market it and bring people in here and to that end I think we well we struggled but we also advanced and it's a long way back before uh, fax machines before any computers so, and we, we went along and, and uh, got, got by that way but to me rather than town itself hasn't changed all that much mm -hmm. and uh, I would have hoped that it should have as I always had that ambition and belief back then that Rutherglen should have developed into a lot bigger and better town than it currently is. Now, of course, Rutherglen had a reputation for fortifieds and big reds, but you had a very good reputation for Chenin Blanc. Yes, well, my father didn't say much. He hadn't learnt anything much about winemaking and... He uh, didn't want to grow this and didn't want to grow that, and it's only now in these recent times with frost after frost after frost that we found you find out why, why what happened even in those days, and this is only just a repetition of what happened many years ago. Uh, but uh, we uh, grew Shannon Blanc, and we thought initially, initially we thought we were growing Chardonnay, but it ended up with a Shannon Blanc, but it. it Grew very, very well at home, and particularly when you put some water on it, could keep keep it fresh and keep the acidity up rather than letting it ripen too early. It made a beautiful, light, fruity wine. Mm. And it, was very, it, very, it was very popular for us, and, uh, and uh, we'd like to thank Mr. Shannon Blanc. <laughs> That's good. I mean, it, it, it really is something you're, you've been noted for. Yeah, I can remember buying a bit many years back. Uh, are you still making um, 
fortified as well as well, we haven't table really wines. made much wine in the last four or five years and my son Brian's doing things nowadays and I'm just not sure which way he wants to go he's disillusioned with a lot of aspects of it and it's it's going to take a big effort from him to to get back to where we once were I'm just reached the age now where I can't be much help to him and uh, but we'll be there for a long time to come mm. oh, that's good have you noticed Rutherglen wines generally changing much? What, what, what do you think of what's been happening at, that you've seen? It's interesting. Styles have changed over the years and it first started off with reds and then they couldn't sell, Australia couldn't sell any white wines and they had a white wine a campaign in the middle 70s and then uh, for, forever since more white wine has probably been far more popular than red wine. Now that red wine is coming back in, it's been a little bit lighter style than, than Rutherglen. Where, where the bigger styles of red wine and Rutherglen, they've got a, a regular market and a good market, but whether it'll increase uh, remains to be seen. Uh, I'm a bit, uh, I'm, getting, I'm a probably a bit old in the tooth and look at things a bit differently and probably not market orientated in some of my opinions. I have still got the opinions that uh, your better quality red wines are a little bit lighter in alcohol than we in Rutherland have tended to do. Uh, the emphasis for all companies, all places in Rutherland winemakers is to make them 14 plus percent alcohol. I would like to see them to get closer back to 13%. I just firmly believe that the varietal, varietal component of the fruit should come through a bit more than the, the heavy alcohol. I just think they're better, uh, it's a better drink. Mm. And what varieties of red are you producing at the moment? The main one is Shiraz and I think it always will be. Uh, there's dip slightly bit different styles of Shiraz and different soils. Um, Cabernet, well, a big problem in Cabernet and rather than probably it was more Cabernet Franc anyway. And that's something we've learned through experience that uh, we got what we got and we thought we had Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, probably the true Cabernet might have been better. Uh, but there is a there is a place for the different varietals, but in a smaller quantity, like your Malbecs and, and your Cabernet Francs, I suppose. And Pinot Noir is the other questionable one, but um, people from down south say, why do we bother to even grow it? But uh, I think a little bit of an attempt to grow it here and there doesn't, go, doesn't do any harm. Mm -hmm. whether, you, whether the newer varieties, Sangioveses and others, are going to uh, to take off, that's, that's fine to grow them and produce a good wine, but that's not the problem. The problem is selling them and getting popularity from your local people and others when the expectation is that Rutherglen should have a big, heavy, heavy red wine. So probably though, they'll never take off from around here just on that historical aspect. Mm. Even though they're a lovely drop to drink. Yes. I might add uh, that Looking through some of the old books at home, a lot of the varieties that we used to grow that were in a very old docket book at home from when they bought grapes by the hundred weight, um, uh, they, everything that's in the book that they grew growing now, the new, newer varieties, they did grow them one time but they fell out of popularity for many reasons. Some as they got disease easily, including, like, including odium and that didn't have sprays to control them. Mm. And others, for another reason, they were too hard to grow, meaning too many suckers or the wood was too hard to prune or too hard to pick. An example of that is Cabernet. It's an awful damn grape to grow and to get into the bottle. Uh, but the, uh, for many years, when you think of my early, uh, earlier times, I noticed there for a few years in this very old notebook they, that they had that the great-grandfather bought these grapes BWW and I never ever knew what they were. And I, could never find out what, what they were. And it's only in recent years that someone told me, and I never thought of it at the time, but it's very, very simple. It's black with white. It was little grape growers that had <laughs> yes. a mixture of black and white grapes, and they just put the whole lot in and sold it on to, to our place, and it was black with white. 
Well, that's intriguing. And, uh, and of course, co-fermentation of a small amount of white oh, in well, black it, has now become very popular. Well, it would have gone into, we fortified wine and it, it would have <laughs> gone into port anyway, or, or, uh, or a fortified wine anyway. Mm. What will other people, what will Brian think of your contribution to Barnawatha and the wine industry? You've been a judge, of course, too. I've been a judge. Uh, I found it very hard and difficult. I didn't have the education and the clinical laboratory you know, earlier in my career, and that was detrimental to me being a judge. And I suppose when I look back at that eight or ten years of me trying to be a judge, I, I suppose I judged and did it, but I probably wasn't what you'd call a successful judge because uh, I just lacked the chemical background of explanation and diagnosis from the start and probably didn't work elsewhere with bigger, larger wineries and didn't taste the amount and number of wines over a period of time in my younger days. Uh, but that's not to say that, uh, that I wasn't a bad judge. So in, in those early days when I did judge, we were judging the people that weren't in the wine industry mm. and they were just um, interested people that loved their wine and obviously drank quite a lot. An example, Dr. Max Slake. And, and then there was another one in Sydney, Rudy Common, who I think is an art, art dealer. That's right. Uh, so those people just, and uh, of course the major one of course is uh, Len, Len Evans, and, but those people just for sheer volume of wine and their interest in it and to, 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 to seek and to search out different wines, it was just marvellous to see those people at work. It gave us an in, impetus when I did start judging to see what they could attain and they didn't hear my thinking, I'm a bit compromised a little bit my lack of variety and uh, scope when, in my little wine but you could see these other play fellas pick this all up. But, yeah, I would have liked to have an earlier and a wider grounding of wine and wine quality. Mm. And what are your hopes for Rutherglen wine industry in the future? Where would you like to see it go? Or if, or would you like it simply to maintain what it's doing at the moment? What, 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 what would you like to see happen? I would like to see it maintain what it's doing at the moment but it's got to we've obviously got to just bunk up our production and availability of some white wines for table wines to complement the cellar door visitors that come and then hoping that they will add on and buy a little, little bit more fortified wine and, and uh, I would just like to think that uh, the red wines just might be a little bit lighter in alcohol and a little bit softer. And I think we'll always have our fortified wines, but I, and I would like to see them, I would like to see them really sold nationwide and internationally a little bit more, but that's, fine for me to make that comment because I, did, I don't have to do it. It is a big job to do it, but if, the, if it can be popularised and sold a little bit more, say overseas, well then Rutherglen I think might grow in stature as well. And we, we still have got um, the capabilities to make good white and red table wine. But at the moment there's nothing of any volume in that line. I also might add, uh, I don't mind being quoted as saying I'm not a Sauvignon Blanc man, and, uh, I, I, but I, and I think there are plenty of other white grapes around that, we, that are just as good and better, and I'm just not sure we want to search for a wine that's on the side of a hill in Italy or on the plains of Spain. I, I think we've already got enough grape varieties uh, around to do something more popular with. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add about? Oh, I think it, it will always, um, it, there'll always be wines around Rutherglen, but it's, it's indeed, it's indeed just a hard, any business is hard in this day and age and it's not helped by uh, the ever popular uh, desire to, to, um, 
up your own remuneration. Everybody wants more money and they want CPI increase in wages every year. And as far as I know, I've never seen a CPI put on a bottle of wine. So you've either got to make more wine or, or um, people have got to drink more or they've got to pay more. And that's really not going to happen. And probably really, uh, if we're to sell more wine at Rutherglen, it might mean that other areas don't sell, more, don't sell as much. It's, uh, there might be a limit to the amount of wine that can be drunk in Australia with the existing population. So it, it still is a competitive industry, small wines, but I, I think we've been lucky in Rutherglen that the, our small little winemakers of Rutherglen, over my lifetime of, of it, it's around about uh, uh, 35 years, I suppose, now, uh, we have been a reasonably cohesive group, but I, I think it's, it's, it is, it's the start of a new era now, and I've done my 30 years, and uh, I'm, it's, it's so different now. What my thoughts and aspirations were 30 years ago, it, it, it's, that's gone, it's changed. If the page has been turned over and it's a new era, and it's a new era in as much as you've got the technology and and advertising promotion and uh, we thought we were good making good wines and people will come to our gate. That's not the case. You now got to tell everybody about it and get them to come really rather than just make it. Mm. Okay. Well Bernard, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us. I think there are some wonderful recollections there, uh, particularly what you said in the early years about Barna Waffer and how distinctive it was in comparison with Rutherglen. So we're very pleased to have had you come in and uh, record your comments. Thank you. Thank you.